I decided to raid my, I don't know what I'd call it, media wall to pick out some of the graphic novels that I've collected over the years. I'd like to share some of them with you and to talk a little bit about how graphic novels have impacted my journey through architecture. Graphic novels are really unique for how they bring together text and images to make stories. These multi-page books are filled cover to cover with drawings and offer a vast array of possibilities for conveying space and narrative together. I initially got drawn into graphic novels while on a trip to Paris in 2010 and I stumbled on ex an exhibition where this was the catalog and I couldn't understand the exhibition text because it was all in French, just like this book. But I was so fascinated and taken by this show that I never wanted to leave. It was honestly one of the most architecturally energizing days in my entire life. I bought this catalog to, to take with me after uh, viewing that exhibition. But I accidentally got this French language version not knowing that uh, they actually had an English version one. I didn't care because I was surrounded by all these comic drawings of architecture and it made me so giddy that I think I've been trying to figure out why I was so giddy ever since. The exhibition was housed in the Palais de Chalet. Ch Chaillot. Oh. The exhibition was housed in the Palais de Chaillot and was about how the city appears in comics and graphic novels. It chronologically organized 150 different authors and 350 works, ranging from Tintin to Batman. Of course, the city figures into all the presented works, so it's pretty fascinating to see how the city is drawn in so many different ways. From dark and moody and gritty scenes of infrastructure, to fantastical, colorful, imaginative possibilities of buildings and places that could never be real. It featured famous pieces of architecture depicting the life inside, to an everyday scenes set within anonymous settings. There were cities presented as washes of color or staccato line work, bird's eye views and grounded perspectives. But even more fascinating is how these link stories to these settings. For a long time I've been chasing how stories and architecture relate. I know the buildings have histories that people tell and sometimes these histories are actually depicted on the building itself. But also, buildings can coexist with things like books or films or graphic novels to reach people in hybrid forms of history, fiction, and reality. These two drawings are really the ones that resonated me. This one and uh, this one here. Maybe that's because they were presented really large in the show, but I can't really explain why it appealed to me, but I can explain how they transformed the way that I approached architecture. The first one is by Mark Antoine Matthew called the World Institute of Dream. I honestly don't know where the drawing comes from. Everything I found about it is in French, but Matthew's work is incredible. The drawing depicts the bed from Little Nemo inserted into the city as a building. The name of the building shows that it's an institute dedicated to dreaming. And the joke is that the shape of the bed could somehow correspond with how an institute could be run. Maybe the bedposts are dedicated to studying the four pillars of dreams, or maybe the headboard is where the supporting documents are stored. The other image is from a graphic novel called City of Glass, written by Paul Oster, and drawn and interpreted as a graphic novel by David, and let me get this right. It's very easy to say if you understand the rules of Italian. David Mazzucchelli. The story follows a man named Daniel Quinn, who gets a phone call that was actually meant for a private detective named Paul Oster, which if you remember is the name of the author of the book. Quinn takes the case to follow a killer, even though he isn't a private detective himself, and this mislabeling of people and things continues until Peter Quinn meets Paul Oster. Paul Oster the author, not Paul Oster the detective. While following his mark, Quinn, or fake Oster, or whoever you want to call him, jots down the route he takes each day on his walks throughout the city. When we zoom out, we see he's been tracing the words Tower of Babel in the grid of the city. The Tower of Babel, of course, is the story about humanity's quest to build a tower to reach God, but the different construction crews couldn't work together due to a lack of a common language. This illusion reveals just how much the story is about how we use language, as people in the story keep misunderstanding each other. This type of collapse between scales, words, and images happens all the time in the book, like when a brick wall becomes a maze becomes a fingerprint. These two examples, the Institute of Dream and the City of Glass, became the inspiration for the very first project that we did when we got home. We entered a competition for architects to imagine new ideas for a site that was along the waterfront in Chicago. Our idea was for the Chicago Institute for Land Generation, and we submitted boards that used a graphic novel style in order to explain the project. The Institute was entirely fictional. It wasn't something that we thought should be built. 
Instead, we used the format of the graphic novel to explain a project that was as much as metaphor as anything else. It took building demolition debris and turned it into patties of land that could be used by the city of Chicago. And the format allowed us to tell a story, which is not always so easy to do with traditional architectural drawings. Like an animation or a film, the windows or the cells of the comic, spaced out by the gutter, allows authors to control time and space in really unique ways. I learned all this from Scott McCloud's Understanding Comics, which is a great series where the comic book artist Scott McCloud talks about the language and the rules for how comics work, and how the artists use these rules to, in order to tell a story. After that competition, I bought David Mazzucchelli's opus Asterios Polyp, and I swear at this point it started to feel like Destiny was putting this stuff in front of me. I mean, it's a graphic novel about an architect. And not only that, but he's a tenured professor that never actually built anything. Ouch. Nevertheless, Asterios Polyp had won numerous competitions and awards, enough to have earned him a highly successful career. He taught because he enjoyed the intellectual environment, and it was at the university that he had met his wife. The book is about duality in a number of ways. The protagonist sees everything as two sides of a coin, reason versus emotion, destiny versus free will, and nature versus nurture, black and white, or at least purple and yellow until he meets someone that offsets his rationalist nature with a more emotionally grounded, shades of gray sort of thinking, and his world takes on more color. The book does a number of unique things related to drawing style, pacing, and toying with the rules of expectations of comics and how they work. Take for instance this page of apples. The apple is drawn in 16 different ways, and none of them are actually red or green, colors that actual apples come in. This shows explicitly how these are all depictions of apples, and in the process of depicting them, we abstract them, and there are an infinite variety of ways to represent things. Each depiction brings out a different quality of the apple. Some showcase the form of it, and others its glossiness, and still others are more like a vague impression of an apple. Matsukeli uses all these kinds of depictions throughout the book, and he uses them to show how different people see the world differently from other people. That's one thing that is great about graphic novels as lessons for architects. They can simultaneously depict buildings and people reacting to those buildings in their own ways. And this allows architects to convey and consider how humans engage with buildings. Anyway, we didn't win our competition, but as a consolation prize, our project was featured in a book called Bricks and Balloons, Architecture in Comic Strip Form. The book is a deep dive into architects that use the medium of comics to design and represent buildings. It features drawings by Le Corbusier and questions if they work like comics intentionally and self-consciously, or if they just happen to look like comics. Either way, it uses texts and images to narrate a sequence of views to explain a proposal for a house. Even if Le Corbusier wasn't trying to mimic comic strips with this arrangement, it shows just how the medium of comic strips and architecture go together naturally. Of course, the book shows comics like the ones of Arca Graham and Wes Jones, and it also features comics like this one, done by my friend Jimenez Lai. It's called Citizens of No Place, and it features floating buildings, lessons for architecture, deer, and a guy peeing. Two years after making that Chicago Institute for Land Generation project, I actually moved to Chicago, where I learned about the work of Chris Ware. This tome <laughs> is called Building Stories, and it comes in a box with 14 different items. These items are books, and newspapers, and flip books. Each piece can be read in any order, but the whole collection centers around an unnamed woman that lives in a three-story brownstone in Chicago. The project took Chris Ware 10 years to finish, and buildings figure prominently in the story. And just like Mazzucchelli's apples, different techniques of drawing and writing correspond to different voices. The building's perspective is shown in cursive, and in this cutaway, the building tallies various occurrences over its lifetime, such as 469 feelings of being watched, 28 grease fires, and 21,779 toenail clippings. In addition to showcasing how graphic novels are able to feature different points of view, this also goes to show how experimental graphic novels can be in exploring different mediums for storytelling. Chris Ware prints different kinds of books with different types of paper uh, and other differences, all to showcase different aspects of the story in unique ways. This is in addition to the beautiful drawing style, the color palette, the sense of composition, which is funny in its depiction of mundane details that are depicted with as much care as the primary subjects. Like an entire pamphlet dedicated to Banford the Bee who lives in the yard. Coincidentally, all this talk about comics reminds me that there's about to be an exhibition of Chicago comic artists at the Museum of Contemporary Art. It will prominently feature the work of Chris Ware, among some others. And the show is designed by my good friend Thomas Kelly and his firm Norman Kelly and the show will offer a rare glimpse into the behind-the-scenes methods for how comic book artists work. 
It opens in June and I'm really excited to see it. So I've told you about how I was introduced to graphic novels and how I've incorporated their lessons into the design and the representation of architecture. Let me know if there's some graphic novels that you really enjoy. Would you like me to do a close review or an analysis of any of them? And let me know in the comments and consider liking the video if you liked it or subscribing if you're into considering the built environment a little bit more deeply every week. Thanks everyone.